Welcome back to our community. Susie Thomas here with you, visiting with Joanne Carpenter, who is the Director of Development at Refuge of Hope. And so interesting to think about the fact that you are growing. Um, We don't like to see that, do we? This is something we'd like to see go out of business. But if there is a need, thank goodness that you are there for people who need you. And um, tell us, Joanne, how do you pay for all of this? Well, as Director of Development, my job is to raise funds and friends for the ministry. And I do that um, through through the help of uh, our, our generous, generous donors. Eighty-three percent of all donations that come in to Refuge of Hope go back into programs and services. Forty-five percent of our income is from individuals just like you and me. Wow. Yes, and we do apply for some grant money, just mm-hmm. like the sisters granted us for the— um, for the women's shelter mm-hmm. uh, and Stark Community Foundation and, and Altman Foundation. I mean, we've just been blessed in so many, many different ways. Our biggest job and my biggest challenge has been uh, in the six years that I've been there is to get the word out that Stark County has our own rescue mission. Refuge of Hope is Stark County's rescue mission. And we serve people primarily in Star County, mm-hmm. not exclusively, because anyone who needs help can receive it there, but primarily, and we are a Stark County mission, helping our Stark County neighbors. And that's when I need to, uh, the message that I need to get out to um, our Stark County uh, donors is that your dollar stays in Star County, helping the people that sometimes are your neighbors that you don't know what's happened to them um, economically, through jobs, through medical, uh, that they are seeking out meals. We serve seven hot meals a week to the community. When I first started in 2009, we only served five. Mm. We grew because no one was serving meals consistently, for example, on a Tuesday night. And I said unheard of. And I remember the first night back in 2010 when we served that very first Tuesday night and we had 85 people show up. Wow. And it's like, where did they eat last Tuesday? Exactly. Where, where were they? Were they hungry? Mm-hmm. So we started on Tuesday nights and uh, we most recently, about a year and a half ago, started serving on Friday nights because nobody else was serving consistently mm-hmm. on Friday night. So we've grown out of the need in the community. Our men's shelter has grown because of the need for homeless men. We will provide over 16,000 bedded nights this year. Our shelter for men is at 138% capacity of the beds that we have for our men. How does that work? We're over capacity. Well, we we provide, we put up some cots, and, and we have a limit on the number of men that we can actually sleep. And then we would go to another off-site location should we go over that again. But we've moved over 90 men this year into their own houses, oh, into their own apartments. the best. So that means 90 of those guys spent Christmas in their own apartment yeah, this right. year. First time in a while. Knowing that if they were a little lonely, that they could come for lunch mm-hmm. and for dinner. Mm-hmm and that they could still be part of the Refuge of Hope family. But 90 men we've moved out this year. It's just incredible, Um, and we do that through uh, connecting the men through different services um, throughout the community, again, working closely uh, with Stark County, um, connecting the men to the services that they need, um, the housing vouchers that are out there, the programs that are out there, uh, rapid, um, rapid housing, and uh, getting them jobs and employment. We've had more men find employment this year than um, I believe ever before. Oh, that's just Which is amazing. a blessing. Oh, awesome. It doesn't solve all the problems, mm-hmm. but for those 90 men, it made a difference in their lives. You take that one person, Ed, that you were speaking about. Yes. That has made such a difference and continues to daily commit himself to being sober and being clean and sharing his stories with others. Multiply that times 90 lives changed where they're now back on their feet. Each one of them with just as significant of a story as Ed. Yes. 
incredible work that you're doing. Now, you're saying that this is more emergency shelter. So there, this is not long-term staying. How do you work with the other shelters Okay, the well, area? for the men, mm-hmm. it is emergency transitional. Okay. We've had some men that were the first place that they come right out of prison. And if we were to say, okay, guys, you got 90 days. Solve all your problems in 90 days. Yeah, wow. You know, we can't do that. Right. Because all you're doing is setting them up to fail mm-hmm. one more time in their life. We've had gentlemen who've stayed with us a year and a half, almost two years, until they could resolve all of those issues, get connected with the right services, the right programs, and to secure their housing or to secure employment. It takes a little time. Now, for the women's shelter right now, it is just emergency only, Mm -hmm. but still connecting them with the agencies in the county that they need to be connected to, trying to get in them, get them into the longer term programs that they can receive the same services that our men are receiving and get their own housing. So we're temporarily housing the women, getting them into a longer term program, and then they're moving on to their own uh, mm-hmm. apartments from there. It's, it's amazing all the connections that need to be made, I'm sure, with Quest Services and some of these others. Um, let's focus on the employment part for a minute. How does that work? Um, are there certain um, employers that are saying, we are certainly willing to um, help someone along, to help them get back on their feet, so to speak, and work with you? And do they have a mentor that works with them? I mean, they have to still go get that job themselves, don't they? Um, if Are there interview practices? Uh, what do they wear to an interview? <laughs> this is too many questions. But I'm just <laughs> wondering, how does that look to be able to help someone who's been on the street turn around and get a job? Well, again, working with different agencies, um, Refuge of Hope is a very small staff, and we're even tighter on our space. So to hire more staff to have longer-term programs or to bring any of those things in-house is very challenging to us because we just don't have the room. Fortunately, there are organizations out there like Men's Challenge, and Men's Challenge takes the men in and gives them some of those skills. I mean, Sometimes you have to start with very basics. What do you wear to an interview? What do you say in an interview? Then once the job is secured, um, how do you budget your money? Mm -hmm. Can you get a checking account? Um, How do you do that? And so we do try to work with the men. Um, I remember one one day I had a young man who was going to go for uh, a job interview. And, you know, I'm kind of mom down there. (laughs) So it's like, um, he said, I'm gone for a job interview. And I said, um, you know, is is that what you're, is that what you're going to wear to this job interview? Well, it's just for a restaurant. And I said, can I tell you something? I've hired a lot of people in my life. I've been in leadership roles in management. And I said, um, if you come in to me with that wrinkly old t-shirt on there, I'm probably not going to give you a second glance, but let's go upstairs because we have lots of clothes donated, and let's get you a clean white shirt and put a tie on. And you can still wear your jeans, Mm -hmm. but I'm going to take a second look at you if you come in to me neat and clean. And he came back, and he got the job. It's a a true story. And he was thrilled and excited, and he said, thank you so much. Thank you. But no one had taught him that yet. No, no. Some... A lot of things on the basics, there's a a great study, it's Bridges Out of Poverty by Dr. Ruby Payne, and it talks about generational poverty. It's a great read, and it talks about the hidden rules in our our classes, from the class of um, poverty, the culture of poverty, to the middle class, to the class of the wealthy. And these little hidden rules that are in there, that when you get stuck in one of those cultures, I mean, I couldn't function in the class of the wealthy by by any stretch of the imagination. And even in the culture of of poverty, I know some, because I've worked um, with people uh, who are in that culture for the last 12 years of my life. But when you understand where people come from, and you can meet them on their level. Mm -hmm. If they trust you, which you have to build relationships with people, life is about relationships, and if someone's going to trust you, they have to know that everything that you're saying is is for their own good, that you're not going to to lie to them, you're going to be truthful, and you're going to be honest. And that's why that young man said, okay, let's go get something different to wear. Yes. Let's, Let's do this. I trust you. 
Yes. Now, if he didn't know me, he could have looked at me and said, I'm just going to wear whatever I want to wear. It's always worked for me before. But no, trust in relationships. And when you work in people's lives and you meet them where they are and you understand, you look at their situation through their glasses, through the lenses in their glasses and not your own, then you're able to make inroads into people's lives. Mm -hmm. That makes a difference. That culture of poverty and these other cultures, culture of middle class, culture of the wealthy, it's a very interesting concept, isn't it, that, um, that there are these hidden rules that I, I've always thought, man, it would be so hard to be poor. And that sounds like the dumbest, most, well, of course, duh. But I'm not talking about the doing without part. I'm talking about how much you have to know. The survival part. Yes, to be able to know who is serving which meals on which day, who's open today to be able to find a bed. Who's a, uh, There is so much. What government paperwork you have to fill out to be able to get whatever compensation is coming your way. It's, it's so much easier to just have a job, go to your house, <laughs> go to your refrigerator. I mean, it's just an easier way to live. And I'm not just talking about having and not having. They have to know so much. They do. And, and if you um, combine that with lack of education, right, lack of, of learning skills, and living in this life of crisis, trying to juggle all of these things at once, it's, you can understand why it's even more challenging for them to break the cycle of poverty and to break out of that. One thing is um, in, in the difference in the hidden rules is um, in the culture of poverty, possessions are people. Oh my. And so your family is holding you back because you're their possession. Wow. Um, and just as a quick example, in the, in the middle class, our, our possessions are cars, our homes. In, in the, uh, the culture of the wealthy, it's those one-of-a-kind items that no one else has. Uh-huh. So it goes from people being possessions to our homes and cars and to those one-of-a-kind a items, the differences in the hidden rules. Don't you find that problems that people, the people problems that any family would face are so similar among the very wealthy as they are among the, the poverty-stricken? It seems like they, they have almost similar problems as far as children getting into trouble, some because oh, yes. they have too much money, some because they have none. It almost goes with... Uh, the Bible says, don't, don't give me so much that I sin or so little that I sin, but just right. the right amount. What do I need for today? And it, it, it just seems that an interesting thing that you're dealing with is the one end of the spectrum when you see that on the other end of the spectrum, we all need the Lord, don't we? We absolutely need the Lord, and that's the key to everything. Any long-term permanent changes that we're going to make in our lives, and I'm talking about me too, is through my relationship with Jesus Christ. It just is that simple. I mean, we've had men stay with us who have master's degrees, Mm. PhDs. Addiction doesn't matter who they tackle. It'll get you. Wow. Joanne Carpenter, it's been fascinating. Thank you so much for your time with us. Uh, Director of Development at Refuge of Hope, please do go to their website, um, refugeofhope.org, and uh, thank you for joining us on our community. Thank you.